Welcome back to Stoned History, guys. <coughs> so the history isn't stoned. I'm just stoned when I'm giving it to you. So today, we're going to do something I've been wanting to do for a while. Basically, a real general survey overview of Western civilization. It is not going to be very focused on Eastern history, and I'm not as familiar or as able to teach Chinese or Japanese history, so I don't want to get into that and make any mistakes. So we're basically going to take the early civilizations, follow that all the way through Western civilization, through Europe, sort of follow the evolution of how one great civilization conquers another one, conquers another one, and we end up with what we have today. So I'm going to be trying to do this fairly quick, so unless you can handle your shite, I don't recommend you being high when you watch this. So hang tight, guys, because it is the history of the world today on Indoor Smokers. Give me another hit of that. So human beings have basically been nomadic. Starting out of Africa, we've spread all the way north into Europe, all the way east through Eurasia, Asia, and most likely across the, the land bridge of the Bering Strait, and then after that flooded, the ice um, receded after the last ice age. You basically had the North and South America branch of the human race being isolated from the rest of the world. And then eventually those are going to come back together again. So at this point, like I said, we've basically been nomadic. We've spread across the entire planet, but we have not yet built great civilizations. So if you're going to start agriculture, if you're going to start domestication of animals, and if you're just going to have large populations of human beings residing in one place, what is going to be the number one most important thing you are going to have to have to sustain that type of a civilization? Water. Water is the key thing. If you don't have water, you ain't going to have none of the rest of that. So it's not surprising to see the first great early civilizations all spring up around great water sources. In China, it would be the Yellow and Yangtze River, where you would see the first great civilizations rise up. Um, in the Indus Valley, around the Indus River and the Ganges. Of course, with the great early civilizations of Mesopotamia, Sumeria, that would be in the great river valleys between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And all of these early civilizations are dating back to possibly 3000 BC, even a little bit earlier. Of course, all of this, we have carbon dating and other things, but nothing is exact to pinpoint the dates of these earliest civilizations. So ancient Egypt, of course, rose up around one great water source, the greatest in the world, the Nile River, the longest river in the world. Through most of the history, you had the Lower Nile and the Upper Nile. Through the first pharaoh in Egypt, combining those two regions, you have the first great Egyptian civilization, what is known as the Old Kingdom. The entire Egyptian civilization is generally broken up into three periods. The Old Kingdom being what we consider those um, pyramid builders, the great ancient pharaohs. So that's from about 2750 to 2000. So the New Kingdom in Egypt takes us up to about 1000 years BC. Around 1750 BC up to around 1100 BC in ancient Greek, a little bit to the east. And what will become the North Mediterranean, you start to see the rise of the ancient Greeks now with the Minoans. This is where you get those early legends and things. The uh, Mycenaean civilization, this period around 1000 BC, is most likely the roots of the stories of Troy. So if you guys are familiar with that, the Greek sacking Troy, that would have happened during this period of time, maybe sometime between 700 and 1000 BC. The actual rise of what we think of as ancient Greece itself has probably started around 500 BC, and that will roll up into the golden age of Pericles. This is when you will see that chain, probably the greatest chain of intellectual thought and how that is connected to power that the world will ever see, one of the great ones. This is where Socrates was a teacher of Plato. Plato was the teacher of Aristotle, and then Aristotle taught Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great would go on to basically conquer most of the known world. This is going to be around the 350 BC time. So now you would also see Egypt being usurped and conquered by the Persians at this same period of time. So when the when the earliest civilizations of ancient Greece start developing, you're having a big transition of power going on in the south. And 
Persia now is basically the most powerful empire in the world. Ancient Greece is rising up at the same time. Now you have Athens and Sparta and some pretty powerful players within the Greek Empire. Inevitably, the two of those are going to conflict. And then that is when you're going to have the Persian Wars, which is probably most famously depicted today in the movie The 300. If you guys have seen the movie, that is about the Battle of Thermopylae Pass. That is when 300 Spartan soldiers, and the Spartans were also Greek, just like the Athenians, 300 Spartan soldiers basically held off an army estimated as many as 800,000 Persians. How can it be done? Well, watch the movie and you'll see. But in the end, as we know, the Greeks would end up winning that war and Alexander the Great would go on to conquer Persia. So it would come back on them. That would basically bring about the end of the Greek era because um, Alexander the Great was actually Macedonian. His father, Philip of Macedonia, would conquer the Greek Empire. But all of that area would eventually now be usurped and conquered by Rome. So we see Rome, the earliest stages around 500 BC, the Roman Republic goes up to about one. The big changing point in Roman history happened at that one point which is basically um julius caesar that was julius caesar start of his reign also coincidentally many people mark it as the birth of christ so christ would have lived from 1 a.d to 30 a.d in that range so this is the point at which rome ceased to be a republic at least in most history you see a transition from the roman republic to the roman empire at this point and that is because now you see the rise of caesar who becomes an emperor the first of which Julius Caesar that would lend the name of course to all the other Caesars Caesar Augustus um, Caligula Caesar Claudius so on and so forth so this is the rise of the great era of Rome now if you are noticing a pattern here that basically great civilizations conquer the previous great civilization the way the ancient Greeks were able to do with the Persian Egyptian empires and then you're able to incorporate and take on all of the strengths and the knowledge of that culture making your culture the most powerful then the romans come along and they conquer greece and that of course then they get all the knowledge all the philosophy all the logic all of that becomes the romans that's why that tradition in history is called the roman greco period the roman greco history that type of thing because it all becomes intertwined now so the roman empire now would be the shizat for about 500 years, ain't nobody fucking with Rome, man. That entire area all around the Mediterranean, basically the most fertile lands, you know, some of the most valuable trade routes. Rome owns all of that. So there's nobody at that point that's fucking with Rome. But like every other great civilization has ever existed, Rome too would come to an end. Around 500 AD, you actually see the, the collapse of the Roman Empire. A lot of this, there are arguments that it was internal corruption and decay some of that being you know just actual people stealing and theft and corruption within the government some of that may have actually been a mental decay caused by the lead pipes that the romans used i mean these people were incredible engineers what they had accomplished even the water system the romans used was so much more efficient than what we do today they would bring the water in from the aqueducts and they had a system where the water would first hit the fountains of the city boom once they had traveled down they come in and of course that purifies the water because you're spraying it up in the air you're aerating it and you're allowing all those particles to settle out so after that it goes into the homes for drinking water for use you know regular daily activities you're going to pull buckets and wells and whatever as the water comes in through there then it goes into the bathhouses and you use it to clean and bathe and it basically becomes brown water at that point it goes out and it goes into the latrines and the bathrooms and it clears out and flushes all of those systems so you're basically having that same gallon of water having four uses rather than the way we have it set up now where of course we use that fresh clean water for every one of our purposes whether it's the toilet or the sink so they were way ahead of us on a lot of that stuff but of course they didn't know about some important things like lead poisoning so that may have had an effect an actual decay on their ability to maintain such a intense complex state level society but the lights basically went out on the western half of the roman empire you still had 
activity and productivity in the east it would actually the capital would move from rome to constantinople later byzantine and it would become the byzantine empire or the holy roman empire but anyways western europe falls into the dark ages or the medieval times whatever you like it is a very interesting period of time interesting in history but the important part for our general overview is basically you had a thousand years where the lights went out in europe that was the night that the lights went out in georgia <laughs> <laughs> as Dolly Parton would say so you really have very little written history that is why they call it the dark ages you um, literacy just went and plummeted at that point you didn't have schools you didn't have universities you didn't have much you had basically some religious orders who maintained what we did have of knowledge now it wouldn't be until around the 12th 13th centuries AD so almost seven eight hundred years after the collapse of rome that you really start to see the rebirth in western europe and a big part of that was the crusades so we got these um western european knights and these fucking warriors who are going down now into the middle east um the birthplace of christ you know judea palestine all of that so here you're already starting to get a lot of roots of the issues that we're still dealing with today in this area we conquer a lot of the muslim held cities and the um libraries and things at that point which are still holding a lot of the ancient greek and roman writings and material that had been lost to western europe during the dark ages because alexander the great had conquered all of this area back and, and created a series of alexandrias and cities and libraries so as a result of the crusades you will see the ottoman empire who was basically what the byzantine empire is at that time they close off the silk road which has been around for 1500 years the major trade route between the east and west so this actually leads us into what would become the age of exploration because now you need to find alternative routes to china and india and that's exactly what christopher columbus is doing so christopher columbus is looking for india he runs into the new world now that opens up so much new resources and wealth but now for the first time in possibly ten thousand years you see the coming together of two lines of the human race that have not interacted in all that time and of course it did have devastating consequences because of the disease and that type of impact that you did not have immunities and things like that because we had diverged for so long i mean people still carry traces of the bubonic plague and that we had become immune to because of um you know going through the fucking black death and all that stuff in europe and basically all of that interaction with asia and with the east west connections where north and south america were a little bit more isolated they didn't have all of that so their immune systems were more vulnerable and they seemed to get the worst of the disease transfer although we definitely got some shit from them too but now you finally see the entire world populated with what we would consider high level state level societies now so you have the revolution in america that will lead to other revolutions like the french revolution that will lead to the rise of napoleon napoleon will go out there and conquer most of old europe mix up all of those old family the Habsburgs, the, the other royal families and things like that and the way things had already been led and that would basically lead us into the age of nationalism here's where you'll see the rise of nations and of course at that time France was sort of peaking in power in Europe under Napoleon. They made the same mistake Hitler would make later trying to invade Russia and getting stuck there in the winter. But prior to France, you basically had Spain at one time, you had the Dutch, you had different people in Europe. Eventually, after the age of Napoleon, it would settle in Britain. And you would basically see Great Britain, the United Kingdom, their age of colonialism, when basically they said the sun never set on the British Empire, which was technically true, because they had empires everywhere, they had colonies everywhere over the world at that time. So that system, that world order, wouldn't be broken down really until you have World War I and World War II. And World War I, of course, is a direct consequence of all of the world finally coming back into contact again. Now, for the first time ever, you have the ability and the technology to actually have a global conflict with over 100 countries worldwide being involved. So that will also break down that dominance and the colonialism of the United Kingdom. And we will see the age we have now with a lot of the issues in Africa, a lot of the issues in the Middle East. They are a direct result of the colonialism and then repatriating people, um, defining nations that never really existed. You have countries like Iraq 
and things that are sort of put together, conglomerates of different peoples, the Kurds, who are basically descendants of those early conquerors of Alexander the Great. So they're a slightly different ethnicity from other people in the region. So anyways, you have these conflicts and things that date back thousands of years that are all being brought to the forefront now when the British leave from these areas. So you'll see this occurring in India, you'll see it all over in Africa. The issue with Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis, if you have seen um, Hotel Rwanda or sometimes in April, that entire conflict basically occurred because the British took the minority group and put them in power because of course it was easier to control the minority group and let that group of people in the country help you control the masses of the group. When the British left, the Hutus and the Tutsis were all up in arms basically about it now because now you had the majority who had been held down by the minority coming back into power. Of course, you would see it in South Africa, all over the world. And we would see the last big shift in the world order in the core basically of the world system at that time it would move from britain where he had been to the united states after world war ii big part of that was the fucking bomb of course we were the only ones in the world who had the atom bomb at that time but more than that it really was about the economic dominance the industry we had is what allowed us to win world war ii the fact that we could produce tanks and ships and planes so much faster Faster than the Germans or the Japanese. At the beginning of the war, they had the advantages in numbers. We hadn't put nothing in the military building. By the end of the war, we could outproduce them 100 to 1. All of this ramped up industry now could basically be turned into winning the Cold War. We basically could dominate the most prosperous economic half century the world would ever know from 1950 to 2000. And of course, that core of power in the world system still resides here in the u.s but as a lot of people know since the 1950s it has probably been weakening and if you look at the pattern of westward advance from china um the indus valley sumeria into egypt ancient greek rome the french the spanish the british then over to america and the u.s you definitely see that trend westward. And so if you were gonna say, where is the next core of the world system gonna be? The next westwardly step would be back to China. And I would say all of the economic factors and other things basically show that to be the case. China will be the next world power. And of course that is assuming we don't destroy ourselves long before that happens. But anyways, that is just a real brief overview of world history and so as you have that contextual understanding the general overview of the history then you can begin to look at much more specific events so like i said there are no independent individual events in history history is an unfolding event that we each get to witness a certain period of that time that's your history be aware of what's going on right now you don't need some kid in school to be reading about this time in history and know more than you do when you're living it you know when you always wondered how the fuck's my dad always know so much about this shit when you're young or maybe trivia or other things well he's got the advantage of having lived through that shit where you're just reading about it in books you know well this is your era so pay attention follow it and then you can tell the stories of what happened in this time be part of that history unfolding But all right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the stoned history of the world as much as I enjoyed giving it to you. If you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to this channel. Ring that little bell so you get the notification when the videos go up. If you enjoyed this type of video, you like these stoned histories, let me know down in the comments and be sure to give us a thumbs up. But all right, guys, have a great rest of your day, and I'll catch you guys right back here again on the next video. Peace.